decision to make with the game and the traffic and so that's the reason why I'm videotaping this event and hopefully it will be online uh, in the next days so you can share it and other people who are not able to attend can actually view uh, the talk. My name is Pashu Christensen, I'm with The Hive. Um, the Hive is an early stage data driven startup incubator, we are based in Palo Alto and I'm managing the Hive Think Tank. Who is new to the Hive Think Tank tonight? Great, okay. So we, we hosted over 150 events, mostly in the South Bay, but also in San Francisco and Oakland. Uh, we have over 7,000 members, and we host these events every week. We usually have from 200 to 700 attendees, um, and we've hosted over 200 speakers. Those are our next upcoming events, so make sure to come by um, on July 7th with uh, Steve Osnack, you've probably heard about him, one of the co-founders of Apple. And uh, these, all these events are free and open to the public, and uh, you just have to register on our meetup group. Then we have a kind of a fun event on online dating and big data on July 15. Another one that is very timely, as you know, here in California on the water crisis and how um, big data can address the, the California water crisis. We'd like to thank our sponsors tonight, our partners, as well as, of course, uh, the British Consulate. And just a few words about the Hive. So the, the Hive itself is a data-driven startup incubator. We invest in very early stage data-driven companies developing applications for, bi for businesses. We invest from 1.5 to 3 million in each one of these companies. So if you're an entrepreneur, <coughs> please reach out to us. And uh, those are some of our portfolio companies. For tonight, please, uh, if, especially for the people who were not able to attend, make sure to post pictures, comments, uh, use Twitter, be on social media. We have a hashtag for the event, Hive Data. And I believe um, the British Consulate have a, a hashtag as well. The Wi-Fi is uh, General Assembly Guest, and the password is Yellow Pencil. And with this, I'll let Victoria introduce Wendy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pashu. Um, so before I introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, I just want to say a few words about um, the other partner organizations that are helping putting on this great event. Um, so thank you to the Hive General Assembly, and I'm Victoria Lady, I'm the Head of Science and Innovation at the British Consulate. And uh, the British Consulate is, uh, people often ask, what does the British Consulate have to do with science and innovation? Um, so the British um, government, as part of their Foreign Commonwealth Office, has teams of scientists and people who work in science policy working to forge um, relationships between the UK and foreign countries like the US. So our team works in eight states in the Western US, forging UK-US relationships in all branches of science, technology, innovation. Uh, we work with academia, national labs, companies, startups. Uh, we cover a lot and we're really excited to have a lot of distinguished case speakers come through um, our patch, so to speak, such as Dame Wendy Hall. Um, so I'll start my introduction. Um, Wendy Hall is a professor of computer science at the University of Southampton, and it's always worth mentioning, what does this dame mean? In the US, people are a little unfamiliar um, with it. So you may have heard of Sir Elton John, you know, Sir uh, Paul McCartney. Dame is the female equivalent, so we have Dame Wendy Hall with us here tonight. Um, she has many, many distinguished um, achievements to her name. Um, you've probably seen a lot of them on the website. Uh, she was one of the first computer scientists to undertake serious research in uh, web science, a field that she has coined and um, pretty much initiated from the get-go. I won't steal her thunder by telling you too much about all of that, uh, but she did become Dame Commander of the British Empire in 2009. Her services to science and technology, she's involved in a lot of um, really neat computer science things and is really an inspirational figure to not just computer scientists, but female computer scientists as well, and is just a fascinating person. I encourage you to Google her. She, according to the Financial Times profile, she has a green plastic triceratops in her rhinoceros. Rhinoceros, pardon me, in her yard. <laughs> um, and if you follow her really fun Twitter feed, you will also learn that she's gone on this pretty amazing cruise through Pan Macau recently. So, as well as her academic achievements, you know, service to society, she's a pretty neat person as well. I'm really honored to have her here. Um, so, with that, I'll turn it over to Dame Wendy Hall. Who 
has insisted that we call her Wendy. <laughs> So yeah, it's winter, actually. We've all got boots on and thick jumpers. And uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, so I'm competing, competing with the basketball. Yeah? <laughs> and, um, but, so it's really good that you're here. And uh, thank you very much to The Hive, which I think is a wonderful initiative. Um, and, and all that you do. Um, and thank you to the British Consulate, which is also a wonderful initiative, a little bit older than the Hive, just a tad. Um, I travel around the world, and the British Consulate offices sort of like to know when there are Dames in town. Um, they wheel us out. No, I'm not. I'm teasing. Um, particularly science Dames. Um, uh, but it's really, uh, so in three weeks' time, I'm supposed to be going to South Korea. MERS outbreak permitting, and again, the British, the British consulate are helping organise some events while I'm there. So, really, really useful. So, um, <clears throat> they gave me this title, The Future of the Internet, What Next? Now, here I am in San Francisco, uh, just north of where it's all happening, talking about the future of the internet, setting me up for a fall. Um, and why, why, why have I anything to say about this? Well, I hope, I hope that what I'm going to say. Um, will be a different take than you're used to. We'll see. Um, we may come to the same conclusions, but um, let's see. So um, I can't. We can't. I've only got 45 minutes, so we can't go through lots of history. Um, I'm old enough, of course. There's a few people in this room. I look at a couple over there who can remember life before the internet, before the web. Uh, most of you are web natives, aren't you? You can't remember a lot of you here can't remember how you had to book a holiday before the web existed. Um, <clears throat> talking to my mum, who's 95, when she booked holidays, you had to write to the guest house and wait for a letter back to see if they could do the dates that you were wanted to go on holiday. And now you just click of a button, uh, <coughs> you're in. I'll get my water going here. So um, uh, I'm sure you know who these guys are. I was just going to... Uh, just make the point that, of course, most people talk about the internet as being the software and hardware all um, as, a, as, as they interact with each other. But, of course, we need to remember, as computer scientists, that, um, well, I am anyway, there's a hardware layer, and there's a software layer, and there's a people layer, and there's a policy layer. And uh, computer scientists understand and believe passionately about abstraction. So these are very important. But, of course, um, it all started, well, when I say it all started, um, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, uh, the co inventors of TCP IP, uh, enabled the internet as we know it to happen. You know all this because of the, and it's very important at the end of the talk that I make this point now, because it meant that any computer could talk to any other computer on the network. And then, uh, so I was uh, back in the 80s. Uh, when I started by working computing, we were using email and everything, and I was, uh, so I would begin to use the internet, and then I started thinking about these ideas of multimedia and hypermedia, and um, I haven't got my phone with me, but I started playing around with the idea of putting pictures onto a computer, now in nine, and video onto a computer. So in 1987, 8, when I started to do this, that was science fiction, right? And now, you know, you have your phone, and everything we were playing around with 25 years ago, uh, you can now do on a little mobile device. And it's happened so fast, and yet it's also been so slow. I remember it seemed like forever. When I started in this world, there was no digital video. 
uh, so we had to write code to get the video up on the computer screen and interact with it. But actually, we could interact with it better when it was analog video than we can with digital video. Because analog video, you had frames and you could just program the frame to do the interaction. Well, with digital video, you can't do that because it's just differences. Anyway, that's either here or there. Uh, now, how many of you know that man? Tim Berners-Lee, and he is what nationality? What, what nationality is he? Uh, you're not sure? She said, someone said, British. British. No. Well, you're British? No. Oh, I thought I heard British. I have been there, but it wrapped up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a sir now, Sir Tim. Um, anyway, that's Tim Berners-Lee, and in 1989, he wrote a document called Information Management, a Proposal. And on, in this document, it was 1989, I was working on this idea of hypermedia as well, the idea that Ted Nelson, who lives uh, in Sausalito, uh, he invented the terms hypertext hypermedia in the 1960s, put the idea of uh, using computers to enable to link information using this concept of hyperlinks. I was working on that in Southampton, and Tim, in, he was at CERN, the nuclear physics lab in Switzerland, and he wrote this proposal defining um, what was to become the World Wide Web. And on, if you look it up on the web, everything about his, uh, his design uh, is here, including the link. The, so this is the web of documents here, and he talked about hypertext, you can't read it, and hypermedia, and... Um, accessing the internet and then in the bottom right hand corner is actually the beginnings the framework for the web of data linked data i'll come back to that in a bit and his boss at the time he wrote this in march 1989 his boss mike sandal wrote at the top here vague but exciting <laughs> <laughs> and that gave uh, that's now a very famous document um, that gave tim permission to carry on developing this idea as part of his day job at CERN, basically the rest, as they say, is history. Here's the history. So, <clears throat> here we are. One website. He put that website up, Christmas 1919. And uh, we were just talking about this web observatory that I'm going to come to later. We're trying to get people to use things on the web. We're trying to get people to use the web. If you, you can't remember, many of you, what it was like. Um, before, but trying to persuade people to put their documents up as HTML documents onto the internet uh, was really hard at the time. And uh, in 94, uh, two things happened. One, uh, Mark Andreessen and his team produced a new browser for the web called Mosaic, which is a real tipping point for the web because Tim's uh, interface for the web was an editor as well as a browser, and it was really quite complex to use, but he said people will want to write to the web, and he was, he was right about that, but it took much longer. <coughs> Mark Andreas and the team produced Mosaic, which of course became Netscape Navigator, and at the same time, uh, Tim, and this is, it was also, you think, oh, deja vu, he, um, he was trying to persuade the European Commission, uh, this, to fund the World Wide Web. He didn't want to, he, he was, and this is really important, he felt really, the big legacy for Tim was the openness of the protocols and the fact that he gave it away. He didn't seek to commercialize it. Had, um, he baked, because he built it on the internet and the whole idea of effectively people who understood and loved the technology voting for the standards um, so he built on that idea, and he and CERN, CERN, the organisation he was working for, also said we won't charge for this. We will give it away. There was another system around at the time called um, Gopher, and there was Waste as well. But Gopher uh, came out of the University of Minnesota. I don't know if any of you remember Gopher. I looked at people by age, not many in the room, and people were beginning to use it around here. This is pre-time, of course. And um, uh, then the university was so said, oh, we're going to start selling that. And um, suddenly people stopped using it. 
And Tim's thesis was, I've got to give this away so there's no economic barriers in the way of people using this, because either everybody will use it to enable it to achieve its full potential, or nobody will. It will just be siloed. So the interesting question is, what would have happened if Tim had been a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs or someone more entrepreneurial who thought they wanted to make money out of this? But the other thing is, I would say, in 94, because he didn't have any funding, uh, and never has made any money out of it. He, had to, he was trying to persuade the European Commission to fund it, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take the risk. But uh, Michael de Tussos, who was head of computer science at um, MIT, uh, was a friend of George Metakides, who worked in Brussels, the Greek mafia, of course. And um, I shouldn't say that today, should I? Ooh, what that? There's still things, bad things happening in Greece for, for, for them. But the um, uh, time, they, they thought, well, we, we're going to have to, because Michael de Tussos was, could get funding to create a chair for Tim at MIT. And so they agreed to find a million dollars each, put that into a fund to create this chair for Tim, so he was going to move from Europe to MIT. Um, and uh, the document they wrote, they submitted to the people in Brussels, and I've got a copy of it actually in my office. Um, it says something like, uh, this web is amazing and there are 700 and something websites. You know, it's unbelievable. That was here, 700 websites. That seemed an awful lot. And now, of course, it's completely dominant. And the, the the way he designed it and the fact that he gave it away has drove the business model. We were talking about the web, the business model for the internet, and what drove the dot com boom and burst here. Um, and it's very much driven by the design, as everything is. So effectively, if you're going to make things work on the web, you have to give it away. If it is a web application, you have to give it away. Uh, give it to people for free, and persuade everyone to use your system. Um, when, I mean, obviously, when you do sell things on the web, there are services that you sell, but if it's a thing of the web, where it's all about the network effect, and that's the key thing about the internet and the web, they work because of the network effect. The more people that use it, the more people will want to use it. And until you get enough people using it, nobody wants to use it. So it's when do you get the tipping point? When does it, how do you get things to go far and then how do you make money out of them? And that's very much driven by the way the system is designed. Uh, a couple of other things to note. Uh, one, of course, here we are, the home of Google more or less. Um, doesn't, Google doesn't really emerge until nearly 10 years after the web. And this is another thing about this world it's very hard to design in advance of what's happening because, again, it's the network effect. Until you've got lots of people using it, you don't really understand what it's going to do. And that's because uh, you can't really predict what people are going to do. And that's how the whole thing evolves because we do things with it. We put the content on. So it's because of us that, the thing, that it grows. Uh, the same is true of all the um, web-based uh, type applications, the Facebooks, the Twitters, um, uh, Google, uh, all the social networks. They grow because we spend time and we creating material, um, putting our lives in, onto the web, effectively our videos, our photos, everything. Uh, and. Um, you can't, it's really hard to design in advance the types of tools that you need to make it work. So they're often, they often come afterwards. The, 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 so it's, this is a very important uh, concept because basically we all talk about the technology change in society, but actually it's what we do with it is society that also uh, changes the technology. It helps to uh, shape the technology. So my social science friends, me the word co-constituted, so it's, it's a very socio-technical idea. You can't understand this just by understanding the technology.
But you can look at sometimes, as we again we were talking before about this first dot com boom and uh, dot com bubble, the boom and the burst. And when you look at it, of course, it was it was bound to happen because the technology, Wi-Fi and broadband, don't appear until into this century, 2001 and two. So here we were trying to sell into a world that didn't have computers. Nobody had computers in their home. I mean, a lot of you won't remember this. But basically it was too slow, they were too expensive, there was nothing for most people to do with them. So there were, and it was just the same as when the printing press was invented. Uh, you're trying to make money out of selling books to a population that can't read. These people were trying to make money out of selling trying to sell on the web to a population that didn't have computers. So it really wasn't, the, the technology just wasn't there. And of course, it, it emerged here, and since then, all the stuff people are trying to do here has come back again. And that often happens in this world. It's very hard to get the investment time right, because the early movers, the first, first, of, first movers are often the people that don't make the money, and you see the same idea come back again two or three generations later, and it makes, it makes money. Uh, so you have to, this is just looking at uh, this evolution from a technical perspective. Um, and of course, once the browsers became, the first mosaic was read-only. Um, once the browsers started to evolve so that you could write, and you, we started putting our blogs and our photos and our videos on, then as Tim predicted, people would want to write to the web and and that's what fuels the growth. And so now we're into the world of social networking. But I mean, when you think about this 25 years is an absolute blip in terms of civilization. Um, you know, it's become something, it's, it's completely unprecedented. The speed at which this has taken over our lives becomes so ubiquitous um, in really just a blink of an eye. And the social networks are just a third of that um, and uh, are likely to go as fast as they've arrived. Who knows what, what, where Facebook and Twitter will be in another five years, but probably not where they are now. Something else is likely to have come along um, because of the, as the technology moves on, uh, the way we want to use it changes. So, uh, uh, this is really the, the looking back to see the story of this, this thing that we're going to try and predict the future of. What's, going to, what, what's it going to be like in the next 25 years? Well, one, just before I get to that, the, um, as I said when I showed you the picture of Tim, the, it wasn't just a web of documents that he was talking about. It was also uh, a web of data linked data and he um, he always predicted that this would make uh, a much richer environment because machines can and this is the hive uh, is all about data world um, machines can interpret data as long as we describe it well in ways that we can't possibly achieve we can look at documents and immediately understand what they're about Machines can't do that, and it's a long way, and we're still a long way off a machine being able to interpret text or a picture or even harder video and so on. Uh, but you give a machine huge amounts of data described so that, uh, you know, we're using ontologies or whatever, something as simple as schema, describe the data, and uh, a machine can process that very quickly and come up with answers that we couldn't possibly. And Tim's, Tim was very much about not only do, oh, is this data, we're going to be producing this data, but the key thing is to link it like we do with documents. And that is just beginning to hit, that, that, that revolution is part of the many, many companies now. But back in, uh, so the web comes along and starts to get big in 94, 95, 96. And 10 years later, um, 2004, 5, 6, Tim was very concerned about the fact that um, the, uh, 
the web of data wasn't emerging and no one was, uh, everyone was ignoring him and, and um, not putting their data out there. You could say, you've given me your documents, now give me your data. Um, and uh, we started talking about this. Um, my colleague, Nigel Shabwell, Tim and I. Um, and in 2006, we published a paper called um, The Semantic Web Revisited, because he called it The Semantic Web, uh, because the idea being, the linked data web being that um, if you, um, uh, you're going to semantic, so my brain's going, I only flew in last night and I just can't make the connections. Ah, the, uh, let's call it the semantic web, the idea being that the, the links would have meaning. If you link two data objects, you'd say why they were being linked. Um, <coughs> but the AI community had made that very complicated. So we said, sim can simplify it all down, uh, and as people are doing today, put the data out there, uh, if it's open, or make it machine readable, even if it's a closed environment, use the same protocols, HTTP, give everything an identifier, which is going to be really important as we talk about the internet of things later, and, um, and use some syntax uh, to enable it to be linked, like RDF or XML if you want. And as we were talking about writing this paper, that's when we produced, we started thinking, whoops, we've gone wrong way, we started thinking about this graph. So here we were in, um, around here, thinking about why the web of data wasn't taking off. And we started to look back at this and all that stuff I told you about, everything being co-constituted in a socio-technical system, we started to review that. <coughs> uh, we are, of course, now in the age of data. Um, the web of linked data was always part of the divisions, I said. Uh, he used the concept of open data to get people to think about this and to uh, talk about linked open data uh, being more powerful than open data. And now we're, everybody talks about big data. Um, but the, the data we're talking about, and when you think about every time somebody uses the internet, you leave a digital footprint, a digital trace, you take each of those bits of data, you've got big data on steroids. Because it's not just data about things, it's data about people as well. So you have all the issues of privacy and trust and security and so that's why I call it big data on steroids. And all that wraps up into why we coined this phrase web science is um, the study of this, how this ecosystem that we've created has, it, has evolved and will evolve. I always say there's two things I don't like about web science. One is web and the other is science. Because it makes it sound that it's just about this little system called the web. And the science means it's very technical. Or actually, when we talk about web science, we really meant the web of people as well as the technology. And by science, we mean in the broadest sense of the, of the word understanding and knowledge. So that's really become my passion since uh, oh, about, ten, about 10 years now, to understand, because it, um, the, the thesis is, in order to understand the future of where it's going, we have to take a socio-technical view. That sounds very academic, it just means you've got to take into account lots of things other than computer science. You have to take into account philosophy and psychology and sociology and uh, mathematics and economics and law because uh, and, or, and many many different subjects that's just an illustration of the types of subjects that need to be put the perspective of which you need to look at how the system's evolving because as governments make uh, policies uh, the lawyers make laws to regulate things uh, the mathematics determine how the network grows, um, sociologists study human behaviour, and it's what we do in this ecosystem that makes it grow. Uh, you need to understand some of psychology again to understand behaviour. Uh, there's so many things in here. Politics is really important in terms of understanding what's going on. And so we talk about 
you don't have to know all of it. You don't have to be an expert in all those subjects, but you need to have uh, an understanding of more than one of them. Uh, oh, you don't need to know about that. We organise conferences and workshops around the world. Something I will tell you, because I'm going to go on to tell you about the observatory. Uh, when we were setting up uh, Web Science as a new discipline, we established something called the Web Science Trust and then the Web Science Trust Network of Laboratories. And we have, actually we've just gone up to 19 labs. Um, uh, and particularly around the world where they're the thought leaders of this space in universities, major universities around the world. And increasingly bringing on um, labs in the um, developing world, like uh, India, huge on the users got one in Adelaide, uh, out in the Southeast Asia, um, one in St. Petersburg, we've got one in China. Um, I haven't got one, we're, we're looking to, to uh, get labs established in Africa as well, as the internet, uh, as people there start to, the interesting thing for me in the developing world is that as people come onto the internet, through a mobile phone, unlike most of us who first started using it through a computer like this, and all of us can read. So there's, and, and it's in our language, mostly, I mean, if you think of like, like English as the universal language, or uh, it's in the major languages around the world, of course, most of, there's more on the web in Chinese than any other language, but, but basically when, you, when you're going into developing countries, a lot of people can't read, and hardly afford the SIM cards, but this is the environment under which they'll get onto this uh, ecosystem. It's very interesting to see what they do with it. Mainly they start use it, using it to make money. <laughs> so another way we think about this is, and this I think is really important for looking to the future, because it's this whole idea of 